Secretary Esper, welcome back to Fox News Sunday. Thanks, Chris. Good to be with you. Let's start with that terrible shooting in Pensacola. We know at least one of the people that the Saudi officer killed was a recent graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy. Did he target Americans? Well, first of all, it's a very tragic incident. Uh, our condolences go out to the families of those who were killed and certainly those that were injured as well. And so uh, we just want to extend our, our heartfelt concerns for all of them. Um, with regard to your question, uh, I, I don't know yet. I think that's why it's important to allow the investigation to proceed to understand what exactly he was doing and why. But, I mean, it's a fact. We know that three people were killed. Were they Americans or not? I think most people in the country oh, I, 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 My understanding is that they, they were Americans that were killed. That's my understanding. And do we have a sense whether he was going after Americans? I don't know that yet. I, that's why I think we need to let the investigation play out. There are reports that several Saudis have been detained and that uh, several of them had been filming the incident. First of all, is that true? And there are some top Florida officials willing to say this was a terrorist plot. Yeah. So some were detained, uh, friends of his that were also on that base, as I understand it. And I also w was told that uh, some one or two were filming it. What's unclear is, were they filming it before it began, or was it something where they picked up their phones and filmed it once they saw it unfolding? Uh, that may be a distinction with or without a difference, but again, that's why I think we need to let the investigation play out. But I mean, that would not be a normal response to film one of your colleagues who's shooting Americans. I don't know. I'm not trying to pass a judgment on it at this, this point in time. You know, today people pull out their phones and film everything and anything that happens. More than 5,000 foreign nationals are in Pentagon training programs. Are you going to review? that entire program, and are you going to try to find some better way to vet, I understand hindsight's twenty twenty. some better way to vet people, foreigners who come into this country for this kind of training, for any links to extremism? Sure. Well, let me say, one of the first things I did yesterday in the wake of this incident was I spoke to my deputy secretary, uh, the acting Navy secretary, and others to say, uh, I want to immediately and make sure we put out an advisory to all of our bases, installations, and facilities and make, and sh make sure we're taking all necessary precautions appropriate to the particular base to make sure our people are safe and secure. That's number one. Number two, I ask that we begin a review of what our screening procedures are with regard to foreign nationals coming to, to the United States. My understanding is currently, of course, they're reviewed by Department of State, they're reviewed by Department of Homeland Security, and they're reviewed by us. And I want to make sure that those those procedures are full and sufficient. Now, why is that important? Not just because of safety, but overall, these types of programs, exchanges, are very important to our national security. Uh, we have something that our potential adversaries, such as Russia and China, don't have, which is a, an elaborate system of alliances and partnerships. And the ability to bring foreign students here to, cha to train with us, to understand American culture, is very important to us building those long-term relationships that keep us safer. I will tell you, during my time in the military, I went to West Point with kids from other countries. I trained at the Hellenic Military Academy in Greece for a summer. Uh, during my time in the Army, I trained with an officer from Africa. All those things helped us understand one another and build close partnerships, and we need to continue that. So what you seem to be saying is, yes, if we need to vet better, we're going to do it, but yes. we're not going to throw out those programs. That's right. There are reports that the Pentagon is working on a plan, considering a plan to send 7,000 more U.S. troops to the Middle East. Uh, I understand the president has not decided on this yet, but what would more U.S. troops help us do to counter the threat from Iran? Well, first of all, I have no plans right now or orders to send 7,000 or 14,000 additional troops to the Middle East. But what I've said consistently, certainly to Congress, and to others that is that on a weekly basis, daily basis, we monitor what's happening in the Persian Gulf. We watch what Iran is doing to make sure we understand what their intentions are. What I'm trying to do in that theater are a few things. Number one, reassure our allies, such as uh, the Saudis and the UAE and other countries in the region. Number two, affirm the right of countries for freedom of navigation, freedom of the seas. And number three, hold up the international rules-based order. So what I'm trying to do from the Defense Department is deter Iranian bad behavior. behavior. If you recall, several months ago, uh, they were going after ships in the Strait of Hormuz. They shot down one of our drones. We've reached a point, I think, that we've deterred further Iranian bad behavior. But as we see Iranian behavior or intentions changing, I, uh, I will change our force posture to maintain that deterrence. But 
you say that there are certain things they aren't doing. They aren't going after ships in, in the Persian Gulf. Right. They aren't shooting down drones. We sent in, you sent in, 14,000 more troops since May. Since May. But the Iranians have continued to ship missiles around the area to Iraq, to, to Yemen. Uh, they have recently tested a new missile that apparently would have the ability to l deliver a nuclear weapon. What would more troops do? Could they deter that action? And are you basically saying we're prepared to get into a shooting war with Iran? Well, what I've said publicly is we are prepared to respond if, uh, it, depending on what Iran does, and they need to understand that our, res our restraint should not be interpreted as weakness. We are prepared to defend ourselves and our friends and allies if necessary. But you've hit on two important things. Uh, for 40 years now, since the revolution, Iran's been engaged in a number of activities that have done nothing but undermine the entire region. It's the malign behavior in any number of countries stretching from Africa to Afghanistan, uh, their missile program, their nuclear program, hostage taking. All those are the things we want in a new and comprehensive agreement with them to, 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 to get rid of. What we want is uh, Iran to join and to become an, a normal nation, a normal country. Good luck with that. <laughs> Well, we have to do it. I mean, it's like I said, they are, uh, their, their hands are in every type of country right. out there uh, stirring things up. Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Yemen. And we can go all across this region and talk about Iranian bad behavior. We are here at the Reagan Library. And back in 1985, Reagan laid out what was known as the Reagan Doctrine, which was that the U.S. was going to support resistance movements mm -hmm. around the world to counter Soviet aggression. In the last few months, this president, President Trump, has pulled U.S. troops out of northern Syria, abandoning our Kurdish allies. He's talking now about a peace deal with the Taliban and pulling out of Afghanistan. When it comes to fighting ISIS, when it comes to fighting the Taliban, isn't what President Trump is now doing the exact opposite of the Reagan doctrine. No, not at all. I mean, let's let's look at, look at those two situations. We withdrew troops from the border with Turkey because our long-standing ally of 70 years was going in because of threats they had about ter terrorist activity coming into Turkey. And uh, what we told them is, you shouldn't do this. We worked hard to get them to not do that. We tried to set, set up a safe zone. But at the end of the day, they were committed to doing that. And we weren't going to put our troops in the path but, but of a Turkish my, my assault. My point, without getting into a lot of the details, is we seem to be pulling back from fighting terrorism where Ronald Reagan was leaning forward in terms of fighting Soviet so President, aggression. President Reagan knew what the threat was. The threat at the time was the USSR. And what President Trump knows is our long-term challenges, Russia and really China. And so the, the key, to, you mentioned Afghanistan, we've been in that country for 18, 19 years. The only way forward is through a political agreement. So if we can reach a political agreement between the Taliban, the current Afghan government, and us to, uh, to, to ensure that a Afghanistan is no longer a safe haven for terrorists, that's a good thing. It also allows me, us, to free up troops to redeploy against those two other countries that we're most concerned about in the long term. All right. We have a little bit of time left. Mm -hmm. I want to do a lightning round, quick questions and, if possible, quick answers about trouble spots. North Korea's ambassador to the, to the United Nations now says that talks about denuclearization are off the table. If they resume nuclear testing, long-range missile testing, what will the U.S. do? I'm not going to comment on hypotheticals. I will tell you this much. Uh, my job is to main main ensure that we are ready, prepared to fight and win tonight if necessary. I believe we're in a high state of readiness right now. But my second task is to enable our diplomats. And so those are the things we do. I work closely with Secretary Pompeo on these issues, and we'll see. I, I think the talks are always open. Uh, I've said, Secretary Pompeo has said, and certainly President Trump has said, we want to sit down, we want to have negotiations, we want to reach the point where we have denuclearized North Korea. President Trump pardoned several members of the military who had either been convicted or were charged with war crimes. He stopped an administrative re review. You said he's the commander in chief. It's his call. But as the secretary of defense, are you worried that this undermines the military code of justice and may perhaps discourage other service members from reporting illegal or improper conduct? No, I don't. I'm a big believer and supporter of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. It's a very capable system. Uh, our, our soldiers, our well, and soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines are well trained on the laws of armed conflict. And look, the President uh, Trump is not the first person to either pardon or commute somebody. Uh, there's a long history of commanders in chief doing this. It's their prerogative under the Constitution. Finally, a couple of questions about impeachment. When we lost, last talked, 
a couple of months ago, you said you were going to do everything you could to comply with congressional mm -hmm. subpoenas of records about the, the cutoff, the withholding of aid to Ukraine. But two days after our conversation, the Pentagon Stonewall Congress didn't release a single document. Are you comfortable with that as Secretary of Defense? Well, what my general counsel had come forward with is that there were legal and technical issues related to the request that we simply couldn't honor. Uh, so that was the reason behind that. And, but do you feel Congress has a, a right to oversight and to be able to see documents from the Pentagon about a program that was approved by Congress? Well, they do, but provided it's done the right and proper way, and that, I think that was the issue. Again, I think um, my reputation is pretty good in terms of being very transparent. I like to communicate with members of Congress, uh, but in this case, there were, uh, is my recollection is that there were technical and legal issues that prohibited us from doing exactly what was requested by the Congress. Finally, you were the Secretary of Defense this past summer when a lot of these actions were going down with regard to Ukraine. Did President Trump ever explain to you tell you why he was holding up U.S. military aid to Ukraine, an ally that was and is in a current war with Russia. Well, look, I'm not going to get into that. There's obviously an inquiry underway on Capitol Hill. Uh, I came into this story, if you will, in late July is when I assumed office. At that time, But you've been acting at, secretary earlier in July. I had for a couple weeks, and then I was out of the game for a couple weeks while we waited for my confirmation process. Uh, I will tell you this much. When I came onto the scene, the three things we were looking at were this. One, is the, was the aid necessary, vital to the Ukrainians in terms of uh, defending against Russia? Number two, uh, had the ad Ukrainians addressed corruption, and that was a congressional concern? And number three, were other countries in the region, other allies and partners, assisting them? And given those three things, uh, we decided to support the provision of Ukrainian aid. At the end of the day, the bottom line is most of that aid got out on time, and at no time did it have any impact on United States national security. And you were never told about any political considerations? I'm not going to get into any of that. Again, there's a congressional inquiry underway, and uh, I'll leave that process unto itself. Mr. Secretary, thank you. Thanks, thank Chris. you so much for talking with us. You've got a lot on your plate defending this country. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for doing so.